You can now find all of C-SPAN's nonfiction-focused podcasts in one place, the C-SPAN Bookshelf feed. Follow now, and you'll get all of C-SPAN's podcasts that are nonfiction book-related every week. I'm Shannon. And I'm Rachel. And as part of the podcast team here at C-SPAN, we wanted to make it easy for our nonfiction book lovers to access all of our offerings in one place. Hear from authors like Kadada Williams on her book, I Saw Death Coming, Joan Biscubic, and her latest, Nine Black Robes, or Neil King, who shared his walking journey from D.C. to New York City in his book, American Ramble. Featured programs will include Book Notes Plus, Q&A, Afterwards, and About Books. You can follow the C-SPAN Bookshelf feed wherever you get your podcasts. Spanning 27 states, America's 58 national parks blanket 84.6 million acres of American soil. That's a full 3.4% of the United States. Hi, I'm Shannon, the podcast producer here at C-SPAN. And this week's Lectures in History program is on landscape preservation and national parks. Professor Laura Watt of Sonoma State University talks about the evolution of the national park system and the effort to preserve pristine wilderness. Professor Watts argues that this approach often obscures the ways humans have already interacted with the land. Stay tuned. Class starts right after this. So today we're going to be talking about um, landscapes and preservation and sort of how preservation unexpectedly changes the places that we set aside as parks or other protected areas. Um, the intention here is really not only to sort of understand the history of these kinds of protected spaces, but then also um, to make the process of preservation more visible, um, to make it you know, easier to understand not only the history of parks, and how they have changed over time, but sort of more importantly, why they have changed over time. Because most of us, when we think about preservation, we think about th something staying the same, and yet preservation actually changes things. So that's really kind of the focus we're going to aim at today. Um, and I'm going to... Yeah, I can manage this. There we go. So um, in the context of sort of open space lands here in the U.S., where often there's sort of this presumption that public ownership is the best way to protect a landscape. And we even see, you know, the the uh, miniseries um, by Ken Burns from a ways back on national parks. It was called America's Best Idea, which is actually taken from a quote from Wallace Stegner. Um, that, you know, natural spaces that have trails and sort of hi for hiking and sightseeing and so on are representative of sort of pure, pristine nature that's just had sort of some boundaries put around it and it's been kept the same like a vase in a museum, just kind of static and ever ch never changing. Um, set aside unchanging for generations. That literally is part of the founding legislation for the National Park Service, which was written uh, and passed by Congress in 1916. So the Park Service just had their centennial last year, lots of hoopla. Um, and, uh, and so you can see that their, their fundamental purpose is to conserve scenery and provide for the enjoyment as well as leave it unimpaired. The, impre the impression you get from this language is that parks are unimpaired and staying the same for generations through time. And so what I'm going to sort of, uh, what my research is focused on for years and what we're going to focus on today is how that unchangingness is actually sort of hiding a whole bunch of landscape change that's occurring as places are preserved. Um, so just as a little backdrop, this will be familiar to some of you from earlier in the semester, um, this idea that um, all ecosystems is from Nancy Langston, an uh, environmental historian and mentor of mine. She states very clearly that all ecosystems are the product of history, including both their natural and their cultural or social history. So um, one of the things that I do in my work is looking at um, how looking at landscape change over time can really tell us something about the ideas that people have about landscape over time and how those ideas changed, uh, change with changing time. So um, a lot of this is really underlining both why understanding environmental history is important to begin with, but then also sort of seeing um, sort of the current state of the ecosystem, how and why it got there from the social or cultural side as well. Um, so we're going to start with just, again, review for my class, um, this concept of landscape. Uh, it, landscapes are um, in, you sort of inherently 
and interact formed by interactions between people and place. Um, so they're always about this interaction. Um, Pierce Lewis, a geographer, wrote that there are unwitting autobiographies um, that, you know, essentially we, by shaping the land, by being influenced by what's on the land and what is possible there, come on in. There's lots of seats in the front. Um, uh, we essentially write our own autobiographies in the landscape without realizing we're doing it. So we're leaving traces of the, the ideas that, that we have, the ways in which we interact with the land, all of those things. And for those of us who are researchers and interested in studying environmental history, we can then come along and look at the landscape and read something as if it were a book or another kind of text. We can actually read something about who's been here and what they've been doing from looking at the landscape and how it changes over time. Um, we may use the term natural landscape or cultural landscape. I always make the assertion that all landscapes are both. There is no purely cultural landscape. Even you know, downtown Manhattan has little uh, plants growing places, and there's pigeons flying everywhere, and you know, there's a lot of nature even in the middle of a city. And similarly, the most remote sort of uh, pristine-looking wilderness has a lot of cultural overlay, cultural management, um, etc., that's influencing what that place is like. Um, and then lastly, all landscapes are dynamic. They're always changing. There's no way of holding them still the way that we do with a vase in a museum. Um, you, know, you can put the Ming vase on a, on a shelf and maybe have some nice climate-controlled uh, air and lighting for it, and it will just stay pretty much the same for centuries. Um, we can't do that with landscapes. There's no way of holding them still. They're constantly shifting with climatic changes, with ecological changes, and with cultural and social changes. Um, so that's really what um, I'm interested in looking at. Um, and a, a prime example is national parks in the way that we often don't notice that landscape change is occurring because it happens so slowly. So many of us have visited the Yosemite Valley. This is a photo that I took when I was visiting there alongside the Merced River. Um, and it's really striking to look at pictures of the same place over time. Um, so again, I think the first week of this course, we looked at some of these same images. This is a photograph taken from almost exactly the same location near the Merced River, um, but taken in 1865 by Carlton Watkins. Um, and it, what, it, what you can see in it a little bit difficult. The trees are in the way, but you can see there's a big meadow in the back. There are some coniferous trees, but there's also a lot of oak, um, of oak trees and sort of willows. It's a much more open landscape than what we see today. Similarly, we can look at paintings from the 1870s. This is by Albert Bierstadt. Um, he's done a little uh, fancy footwork with the sides of the valley. They actually don't match up. If you look at a photograph today, you'll realize that this side of the valley is about five miles west of that side of the valley um, in his painting. But what's interesting about this painting is, again, it's showing us the ecosystem of this landscape in the 1870s, which, again, is meadows and oak woodlands with a few coniferous trees. It's a real contrast to the landscape that we see today, which is almost all dark coniferous forest. Um, not that one is better than the other or preferable, but that the ecosystem here has changed enormously because this place was preserved. This was a place where Native Americans had lived for centuries and had been doing landscape management of their own, mostly through burning. Once that management was stopped and the place was protected, the ecological shifts started occurring. But those of us who visit today and we see this, we think, oh, this is what it's always been like because we don't know that it has that history. So that's part of what we're going to be looking at today, um, is trying to understand the ways in which parks change over time, how they change far more than we recognize, um, and how that helps us to understand what's going on with park protection. So one of the other things that you know, most of us sort of take public parks for granted in a way that you know, most of us have grown up with parks in cities and national parks to go visit. They're kind of part of our culture now, but that's fairly recent. Um, public parks are a fairly um, novel invention in a lot of ways. They evolved in, during the 1800s, um, essentially out of both the admiration of wealthy estates, private estates in England, where they would be sort of, you know, uh, sort of, um, oh, what's the TV show? The um, Downton Abbey. Yes, thank you. I always forget 
words. Um, da- you know, very Downton Abbey esque. You know, this huge estate with rolling hills and people strolling about. But of course, most people couldn't visit those estates. They were privately owned by individual families. So, um, with an admiration for those kinds of spaces, but here in the U.S., this idea that we wanted that space to be more democratic, to be more open to the public rather than just private. Um, they also evolved in some ways from using. A certain public spaces like cemetery, bleh, cemeteries very informally for going for an afternoon walk. It seems odd to us now that you would sort of go strolling in a cemetery. They seem much more formal now. But back in the 1800s, especially in the 1830s through the 1860s or so, that was a very common thing in, in a lot of large cities. It was pretty much the only open space available. And so people would go out for a walk and just enjoy the view and the green grass and and the stones. Um, So sort of a combination of these different kinds of very formal spaces that we didn't want to repeat here in the U.S. um, and these more informal uses. Um, Similarly, preservation itself of historic buildings, say, was originally something undertaken by private wealthy individuals. Um, George Washington's estate at Mount Vernon, for instance, was protected by a, the Mount Vernon Ladies Association, a private organization. The idea that government should protect and preserve places was not just it wasn't part of our culture and until the sort of late 1800s. One of the people who is most responsible for that change is this guy. This is Frederick Law Olmsted. Um, and uh, he was a landscape architect and park designer. Um, He very famously designed um, Central Park in New York City. I've got the uh, original design here. It's a little hard to see, but from from the 1860s. Um, And essentially what he was doing at the time, this was actually not central in New York City. It was way out in the sticks. Um, But he had the foresight to know that the city would grow up around the park and wanted to create a space of of nature for sort of um, people to visit, to just sort of stroll around and enjoy, this idea of sort of creating and designing a wilderness. Um, This was not just a case of setting aside an already natural landscape and leaving it alone, which is, again, what we tend to think of when we think of park protection. What he was doing was making nature out of um, what at the time was mostly old sheep's meadows. Um, There actually is a big grassy area in Central Park called the Sheep's Meadow, and that's why, because there were sheep on it. Um, But, but, you know, from this old image, literally uh, moving, moving earth around, planting trees, bringing nature in to a degree that's deeply, deeply designed. Um, Has anyone been to Central Park in this room? couple of people. Um, if, when you're there, it feels very natural. I've got a picture here of New York City with Central Park today. It's completely forested. There's sort of hills and dales. There's lakes, um, lots and lots of dense trees, a lot of little paths. It really feels like you're in a pristine piece of New York forest that's just been left behind without any buildings. But almost every aspect of it, with an exception of a couple of big granite boulders, all the hills, all the forest, all the lakes are all completely designed and therefore artificial. But we don't feel like they're artificial. We interpret them as natural, as a natural space. And so that's really this idea that Olmsted brought to his work was designing nature to, in in essence, make it more natural or more natural-seeming than what might have been there originally. Um, He also was very, um, he was very, he actually had a lot of nervous conditions himself as a young man and was ill a lot. And he really had this idea that nature could be um, sort of a therapy for people that um, not literally sort of psychotherapy, but as a relief from sort of your your, your stresses of ordinary um, daily life in an urban setting with all the noise and the um, sort of, you know, trains running by and all kinds of crowding. And he thought what people need is sort of this, this escape valve, in a sense, to go and stroll around on Sunday with your sweetheart on your arm, enjoying a sort of a contemplative experience of nature. Um, he very explicitly wanted this to be a public space, open to all classes, not just to the wealthy. So that was really a big part of his of his ambition here. Um, yet the rules that he put in place for your behavior when you were in the park 
were actually much more geared toward middle class and upper class visitors than towards um, working people. They had a lot of rules about you can't have a lot of noise. There's no organized sports allowed. This is very much a version of nature that's contemplative and quiet and sort of strolling about. Whereas if you're a real working working nine to five, or it wasn't nine to five back then, it was more like, you know, six to eight, um, you know, 12 or 14 hour working days, six days a week, you have one day off to kind of blow off steam. So people want to play stickball in the streets, and they want to drink beer, and they want to run around, and none of that was allowed. So in essence, this was created as a public space, but really privileged certain users over others. And we're going to see that these early ideas of how you're supposed to behave in a park who the park is sort of aimed toward still carries through in a lot of our national parks today. There's a lot of presumptions that both these parks are open to everybody, but that there are particular ways you're supposed to behave and interact with nature when you're there, and other ways are not appropriate. So you're not going to find soccer fields in a national park. Um, you're going to find hiking trails. Not everybody likes to go hiking. Too bad. Uh, so there's sort of this, this element to it as well. So Olmsted sort of starts off this idea of, of nature, of parks as designed nature. This then gets combined with sort of how do we get from these designed city parks like Central Park to the national parks that we have. Um, in some ways, the national parks orig originated with a place that didn't become a national park until much later, I think in the 1940s or 50s, which is Niagara Falls in New York. Um, before a lot of Western expansion really started bringing um, awareness of the big monumental Western landscapes that we are familiar with, before that, in the early 1800s, Niagara Falls was considered one of the most stunning natural landscapes that North America had to offer. It is pretty darn stunning. I have never been there. I've just seen pictures, but it's pretty great. Um, and after the Erie Canal opened up uh, easier um, transportation in, in the New York area, it, it became, it still doesn't seem fast to us. It would take at least two days to get from New York City to um, Niagara Falls, but that was instead of a week. So it was greatly, easy, greatly easier to get there. And you get this big influx of tourists coming from New York and Boston, from sort of the urban cities, wanting to go and visit Niagara this beautiful place. They go and have their photograph taken. Um, I couldn't find a date for this picture, but it's clearly sort of the, the late 1800s at some point. But one of the problems with Niagara, here's another just, you know, the tourists alongside the beautiful falls having their photograph taken uh, with a big view camera. Um, one of the problems with Niagara Falls, though, was there weren't any public controls in a way that we understand them now. Again, wasn't an idea. People just didn't have that cultural conception of government stepping in to control space in any way. And, um, and so what happened was you'd get all these little sort of um, tourist stands like we get in a lot of places today, sort of setting up saying, hey, we're going to sell postcards, you know, pay me a dollar or five cents or whatever the price was, and stand here and get the best view. There would be photographers supplying their trade. Um, and, uh, and so you got all this sort of... Um, messiness, kind of messing up the scene. Um, great. So uh, what ends up happening is the, the sort of the grandeur of the falls gets messy. There's little stands. There's people, you know, selling the equivalent of hot dogs and cotton candy today, um, kind of messing up the view. And a bunch of European visitors come to visit and they write criticism. They say, oh, these tacky Americans, you know, they would sell their grandmother to make a dollar. They're, they're essentially ruining the view in order to make these sort of, you know, have this sort of small scale entrepreneurial use. Um, and they just think it's incredibly tacky. How dare they? And this is a time when here in the U.S., we're kind of culturally sensitive. Um, you know, we're less than 100 years old as a nation, had recently sort of shaken off the influence of Europe, the, the Great Britain specifically, but Europe in general, yet all of our cultural ref references are from Europe. All of the writers we read, all of the painters we look at, all of the sort of sense of high culture that we have is European. And so there's this, this push, especially when the Europeans are now criticizing us and saying, oh, 
They're so tacky. There's this push to try and say, what do we have that is, is unique and is different and shows how great the U.S. is? And one of the things that they start to focus on are the natural landscapes that especially the Western U.S. Um, sort of reveals as people are moving west. Um, and so Niagara Falls becomes essentially a negative example sort of of what not to do. We don't want to mess things up the way we did there. Um, so when um, Yosemite Valley here in California is quote-unquote discovered um, by a battalion of military folks who are chasing some Native Americans up the Merced River and sort of come out into this amazing valley, and they're stunned by this incredible scenery that they see. You know, the Yosemite Valley is, is pretty unlike almost anywhere on Earth with these huge um, granite cliffs uh, just sort of dominating this thing. And so to a, this young... Um, U.S. culture at the time, these kinds of monumental, unique, stunning natural landscapes become symbolic of our national pride, of saying, hey, we've got something that those crazy Europeans don't have. And in fact, you see a lot of descriptions of Western landscapes as people are, are moving across the uh, Western uh, territories and describing these places. They're often describing them in comparison to um, castles in Europe or old ruins in Rome and saying how much cooler essentially these places are like oh you could have some tumbled down castle or you could have this amazing rampart of of stone and granite and you know there's all this sort of comparison going on so nature takes on a new meaning of sort of being symbolic of our youthful strength and vigor as a nation um, it becomes very nationalistic to sort of ex to experience these kinds of, of monumental Western landscapes. And it's not just the landscape in this case. Um, there was similar interest in the, uh, the redwood trees, uh, both the coast redwoods here in coastal California and the giant sequoias of the Sierras. Um, again, it's sort of symbolic of something our nation had that no one else had. Just the sheer size of these things. You know, there's all kinds of photographs of sliced through sequoia trees with people posing by them or standing on the stump and seeing how many people they can fit on as like a dance floor to say, you know, look how gigantic this is. This is better than any tree you're ever going to find in Europe. You know, it's bigger and it's taller and it's just, you know, it's what we're doing that's great. The funniest thing for me about the giant sequoias is the botanists who are all about identifying species in sort of the early stages of, of biological um, science in the 1860s or so, they have this giant fight over what to call the sequoias with their Latin name, you know, their, their taxonomic name. Um, the, the British botanists all wanted um, sequoia wellingtonia after Wellington, and of course the United States botanists all wanted sequoia washingtonia after Washington. Instead, it thankfully sticked with Sequoia gigantea, which is a little more descriptive. Um, it's actually Sequoia dendron. Um, so, you know, and again, the descriptions of these places, this is a quote from surveyor Clarence King describing the giant sequoias in 1864. And he writes, No fragment of human work, broken pillar or sand-worn image, half lifted over pathetic desert, none of these linked to the past as today with anything like the power of these monuments of living antiquity. So this is this idea that we have a past, we don't need Europe's past, we have our own, and it's this natural past, this natural history that's better than anything Europe has. Um, so there's a lot of sort of nationalism being in imbued in this. Why does the nationalism matter? It's in part where the idea of setting national parks comes from, is setting aside these landscapes to keep the symbolic scenery pretty and powerful and not sort of messed up the way Niagara got messed up with all these little sort of clattery little shops and trinkets and so forth. Um, interestingly, the idea, this is a, it's a little hard to see this map, the, um, the pink outline here is more or less the, it's actually a little bit smaller than the current Yosemite National Park. The part that's labeled in, labeled in green is the original reservation that was set aside, um, signed by Lincoln in 1864. Um, 
And as you can see, hopefully, from that map, um, all that was protected, the, the original protect area, protected area is very small. It was just the valley and literally sort of the viewshed of the valley. So if you're standing on the valley floor, like where I took those photographs earlier by the Merced River, and you're looking up at the granite walls, the boundary of the protected area is the top of those walls. We don't care about the ecosystem. We don't care about the forest. We don't care about the overall sort of mountains and sort of a large landscape. What we're protecting here is the view. And then by making it into a public park, a government-owned park, remember that all of this land was public land to begin with, part of the public domain, um, essentially uh, claimed by the U.S. when uh, we won this, the uh, Mexican-American War in 1848 and California became part of the Union. Um, so all that is being done is setting aside already publicly owned land, not allowing homesteaders to make claims in it, not allowing miners to come in and sort of mess it up, trying to keep it nice and tidy so that tourists can come and see this grand view and feel this nationalistic pride. Um, the original proposal for setting aside Yosemite did not come from the public at large, which is sort of how we think about parks today, that they are for us and by us and all that sort of democratic language. The original proposer for Yosemite was a representative from one of the steamship companies that was bringing people from the East Coast sort of around the Horn and bringing people to California. Before the Transcontinental Railroad, that was the only way of getting here, um, other than a few people coming overland. Um, and so it was the, the steamship company saying, hey, this is great. If you set this place aside, it's really beautiful. Everyone's going to go want to go visit it. And they'll have to pay us by both steamship and then um, stagecoach to take them there, have them stay in our hotel that we'll build, and then we take them back again. They pay us three times. <laughs> this is great. Um, so this is, you know, it gets set aside. Uh, uh, Mark David Spence, who you read some, some chapters from this week, uh, sort of described both the Yosemite Valley protected area and the Mariposa Grove, which is further south somewhere. I don't think it's on this map. Um, he describes them as sort of powerful symbols of national unity. They're being established just as the Civil War is coming to a close in 1864. At least they hope it's coming to a close. Um, and so they think that, you know, this is going to be symbolic of our once again reunited nation and its strength and vigor going forward in time. So it's both really important as this sort of public symbol, but then also there's this connection with private enterprise. Um, of first, the, railroad, the steamship company in the case of Yosemite, for every other national park that's established between 1864 and 1916 when the National Park Service itself is created, they're all proposed, advocated for, and then served by railroads. So again, the connection to tourism and to sort of industrial tourism, if you will, you know, not mom and pop setting up a little shop and selling you T-shirts, whatever the equivalent in 1900 of T-shirts is. Um, not that kind of tourism, but really organized corporate tourism um, is part of the national parks from day one. It's how they get established. Because um, somebody has to go to Congress and convince Congress to pass this legislation. It doesn't just happen. And that's who's pushing them to do this. Um, one of the other interesting things about the um, Yosemite Reservation is that there's a clause in the legislation that creates the park insisting that the protection be permanent. He said, you know, there's sort of no point in setting something aside for this kind of scenic grandeur unless we're committing to protect it for all time. So it starts very early in 1864, this idea that parks are going to stay the same we have this static view, sort of the sense that all of us have from looking at postcards or calendars, Ansel Adams photographs, um, or our own photographs if we go to Yosemite and visit, um, of the view of what Yosemite looks like. And we don't think of that as being something that changes over time. And in fact, if the Park Service ever moves like a campground or changes a uh, you know, scenic pullout, people actually get upset because they're like, hey, that's not the one I'm used to. Now it looks different because I'm having to see it from a different angle. 
Um, I actually ran an experiment with my environmental history class a number of years ago, um, right at the early days of sort of digital photography. Um, we didn't have Instagram yet or Facebook. We just had Flickr. And during one of our class breaks, what I, I had them type in into Flickr's search engine, Yosemite and view, and have it pull up all the photographs that were tagged with those words and just play them as a slideshow. And I swear, 90% of them were taken from exactly the same spot which is one of the spots where the tour buses sort of take everybody through to the, what's called the tunnel view, if you know Yosemite, up on Highway 140, and looking back at um, Half Dome and El Capitan and sort of this very classic view that we all know. Um, if, we, if something, you know, if a hotel was built in the middle of that or um, a great lightning bolt struck Half Dome and cracked it in half, that's not going to happen, but... Um, we would be upset because the thing that we, we think of as unchanging would suddenly change. And that's part of the idea, again, of preservation. Um, this sort of a natural landscape frozen in time and staying the same sort of for generations to come. One of the last aspects of Yosemite specifically that um, I think is not, again, as well understood, um, not only were they promoted in the early days, uh, you know, sort of pitched to Congress and then promoted by the railroads. But once um, you get the automobile being invented and also our lives changing in terms of the work week getting shorter, weekends are invented, <laughs> um, and people have more leisure time, the combination of these two things really transforms the national parks. They become very auto-oriented. Um, you can see this in an old poster from the 1930s or 20s um, of you know, Yosemite's Mariposa Grove with a tree that just fell over in, last, in, this, uh, in the winter storms this year um, of, with a car driving through the tunnel tree. Um, this is a real transformation as we have more leisure the auto industry express, expressly wants there to be places for us to go in our cars to go visit because the more we drive cars, the more we'll buy gas, the more we'll buy new cars. Um, this is very much sort of, a, um, again, a corporate enterprise. Um, so uh, in the middle of World War I when um, – the National Park Service itself was created to manage the parks that had already been created. Um, they had this whole See America First campaign. You don't need to go to Europe for your, for your vacation. Go see America first. T get in your car or get on the railroad and ride around and see the country that you live in. See these sort of iconic landscapes. So parks were very, even in these later days, were very expressly there to inform us about what being an American was supposed to be. Um, and sort of expose us to these iconic natural landscapes that were supposed to fill us with national pride and, uh, and sort of a sense of, of, of where we're coming from. What time is it? Oh, we're doing fine. Um, and the, they did start coming. I just realized I skipped over. Um, the, the numbers of Yosemite v visitors, it's really telling to see how it climbs up. Um, in 1855 are the first tourists entering Yosemite Valley even before it was created into a park. Um, by 1863, just before it was set aside, 406 visitors arrived that year by steamboat and stage. Uh, ten years later, in 1875, they'd built hotels and a road. There were wagons and supplies coming in. Eventually, the railroad connects the area. By 1916, when the Park Service is created, 14,000 visitors to Yosemite uh, Valley in a year. Um, two years later, in 1918, it had jumped to almost 27,000, nearly doubled because of the automobile. Um, in fact, one of the biggest advocates for establishing the National Park Service in 1916, again, not the general public at large like we tend to think, but the AAA, you know, the automobile industry, was like saying, hey, we need these parks, we need this agency, um, so that people have places to go. Um, so like I said, 1916, 14,000, 1918, 27,000, and in 1997, don't ask me why I don't have more recent data, 4.2 million, almost all arriving by car. Um, so it's, you know, the visitation to Yosemite Valley is now completely insane. Um, and in fact, there's a lot of discussion about when does a park get too much visitation? Should we start restraining some people? Um, but again, what I want you to really get from this is that parks, even though we think of them as these sort of pristine natural spaces, have always been intended for tourism 
and specifically not for sort of the backpacking tourism we think of today um, with, you know, since the advent of REI and people now go backpacking all the time or doing other kinds of really extreme um, getting into the wilderness kinds of recreation. These were really set up for very passive tourism of, you know, driving around in your car and looking out the window and just kind of saying, gosh, isn't that pretty? And taking a picture with your, your Kodak Instamatic or now your iPhone. Um, you know, it's all kind of the same thing. Very, very tourist focused um, process. One of the other important aspects of national parks, though, is that these places were not empty, of course, when they were set aside to make parks. Almost every single park in, um, well, both the West and the East, but certainly the Western parks, almost all of them were inhabited by Native Americans before they became parks. And so part of the process of understanding the story of our national parks is also understanding the people who are displaced from parks in order that they become these sort of unchanging, iconic, natural scenery parks. Um, the, I, we're going to talk more about wilderness in, a, in this class in a few weeks, um, but just to, to bring up the idea very briefly, um, there's been a lot of, of critique over the last few years, I'm someone who writes about this a lot myself, of how the concept of wilderness is actually very ethnocentric. It tends to edit out the native peoples of the Americas and pretend that they weren't there and instead sort of posit that th this idea that um, before white people started showing up in the Western landscape, it was pristine nature that was sort of empty and uninhabited. And that then we idealize wilderness as little fragments of those uninhabited places, which, of course, is not true. Um, uh, again, Spence, who you had some readings from today, um, argues that uninhabited wilderness had to be created before it could be preserved. Um, and this, this sort of type of landscape that, that was being preserved then becomes, he says, reified, sort of remade or made real in a way that it never was real before in the national parks. You get these empty spaces that have only tourists running through them. Of course, they're not empty. There's other people there now. They are just tourists that are visiting. But there's no longer anyone living there. And that's because we had to push those people out and then kind of edit them out of the story. Um, in some cases, they were literally edited out of the story um, in the sense that they were relocated. There's a, a real uh, similar time frame for when the first national parks are being created and when the first Native American reservations are being created. And in many cases, people are literally being taken out of a park space and put onto a reservation space, um, which is much less grand in terms of the scenery. Um, but... Uh, you know, it really overlooks the fact that not only were Native peoples in place at the time, but had been in these landscapes for, in many cases, millennia, for hundreds or thousands of years. Um, and there's an interesting sort of quality. These are some uh, Miwok uh, people who were living in Yosemite Valley as part of the museum exhibit in Yosemite Valley for decades, actually. In Yosemite, they were initially, tr they tried to... Um, move the Native people out of Yosemite Valley, then eventually they sort of let them back in, but on the condition, essentially, that they live in their traditional ways as part of the display for the tourists. Um, not quite like animals in zoos, but something close. Um, that they're on display, people would come by and sort of remark on, oh, look at those outfits they're wearing, look at the things that they're doing, um, that they're there to be sort of um, seen by the tourists. I think one of the things that's that's curious about our relationship with nature as represented by the parks is how sort of the original Anglo settlers and, you know, these railroads and all these sort of folks that are coming into these landscapes can't really quite make sense of people who live in nature rather than looking at nature. You know, that's that difference of being Yosemite being a place to live in and to rely upon the resources that are there and the way the Native Americans do, or is it being sort of a scene that you stand back and you look at? You go to the tunnel view, which the tour bus takes you to, and you take your, your standard photograph or you buy the postcard, and you get the view of the place. It's a very different relationship. It's not necessarily that one is better than the other, but that they're really not the same. Um, and I think that a lot of those early um, Anglo settlers and, and developers really just couldn't understand this different way of interacting with nature. 
Um, there's even in the earliest writings, uh, there's a sense that Indians living in parks aren't a, a, sort of adequately appreciative of the scenery um, in an in an aesthetic way. Um, literally, there's a, a doctor named Lafayette Bennell who's with the military group that first enters Yosemite Valley, sort of chasing some of the Miwok up the valley. Um, as part of this military campaign, um, and he kept a journal and, and while they were doing this this um, this expedition, and he describes once they catch up with the Miwok and they start trying to ask them questions through interpreters and so on, um, he refers to the resident Indian sort of reverence of Yosemite Valley as being a spiritual place for them. He refers to as demonism. You know, it's not Christianity, therefore it's something terrible, um, that it's a, 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 a negative thing. Oddly, he doesn't interpret that as the same kind of awe that he experiences in this place, even though you could argue that those are actually very much the same experience, um, sort of seeing awe in the grandeur, having a sense of a spirit, spiritual, spiritual connection to a landscape, have some similarity. Um, but... You know, he just doesn't see the connection. And in his, in his account, he wrote, In none of their objections made to the abandonment of their home as they're being forced out, was there anything said to indicate any appreciation of the scenery? And he's like, these people don't think it's pretty. They keep talking about how there's deer and there's other resources and it's a really comfortable place to live and they like it and their family's been here for a long time. They're not saying, wow, isn't it pretty? Therefore, they don't deserve to live here. There's sort of the sense that you're supposed to have this aesthetic reaction to a natural landscape, and there's just no room for any other kind. Therefore, these people don't belong and should be moved out, um, which in today's parlance it just seems very strange, right? <laughs> Most of us are like that, no, of course those are two different things. Um, but at the time, that seemed quite normal. Um, Unfortunately, this idea of a national park as natural scenery with wildlife, with rivers, with mountains, without people who are residents, has then been, it's become this national park ideal that we've developed over time. The National Park Service, when it was created, was managed to uh, pardon me, was created to manage these kinds of spaces. So this is what it tends to presume parks are supposed to be like. Um, and every time you and I go and visit a park and we keep seeing these, these natural landscapes that have no residence, where our movements are very choreographed through those spaces. You know, where the, when you get to the, the, the overlook at the tunnel view in Yosemite, you can't see the lodge or Curry Village or the campgrounds. They're all neatly sort of hidden away amongst the trees. All we see is the, the, the empty natural scenery. Um, so each time we visit, that gets reinforced, as that's what a park is supposed to be like. We similarly have exported this idea. So a lot of national parks in particularly the developing world, in Africa and South America and Asia, that were created with sort of the burgeoning environmental movement in the 1970s and 80s, replicated this idea, started kicking their native inhabitants, their indigenous peoples out, and recreating these kind of empty wildlife parks or nature parks for then European and American tourists to come visit with their cameras. Uh, so we see this kind of pattern over and over again of, um, you know, often destroying the native cultures in the process or making them incredibly impoverished and forcing them into sort of more marginal existence around the edges of parks um, in order to create these kind of empty wilderness spaces. Um, Again, they're wonderful places. There's nothing sort of, you know, say, oh, there's this terrible nature. It's horrible. Um, but we do want to understand that they come at a cost, that they come from um, removing people who are living in these places. Here again is, uh, you might have noticed in the previous picture, these, these uh, Sierra Miwok people are standing around in front of teepees, this is not their natural, their usual form of shelter. Um, this is from the Great Plains, but it's part of the American, I, I think this photograph is from the 1920s, it's part of the sort of popular culture in the U.S. of what Indians are supposed to look like. What they actually look like is more like this in that area. They lived in these wooden structures, similar shape, totally different construct, um, 
you know, again, they're not only made part of the display, but sort of made to change how they are living to fit our ideas of what a native person is supposed to be like. Um, so there's this real, you know, I think understanding that these national parks, these wilderness spaces, um, have come at a cost of moving people out, of changing them from being lived in nature to being this kind of iconic nature. So that's sort of Sierra history, starting with Yosemite, moving on to creating the national parks. What does this have to do with my work? Um, this is my opportunity to talk a little bit about my own research here, um, since I just had a book out last year, hooray, um, which is about Point Reyes National Seashore here in California, also part of the national park system. Uh, because it's on a coastal area, it's called a national seashore, but it's owned and managed by the same agency. Um, it's just a few miles west of here, conveniently, so uh, we can all go on a field trip someday, perhaps. Um, it's been owned and managed since 1962 by the National Park Service. And if you look at their webpage or some of the, you know, sort of pr promotional material they put out, they'll tell you that, you know, it's, it was created to protect wilderness and natural resources, sort of a, an, a, a protected chunk of undeveloped California coastline. Um, you get their little, you know, park map. Here you are. And... This is kind of the, the wild California coast that this place is supposed to be um, protecting. But what you don't see very much information about at this park is what was it before it became a park. Um, you know, with Yosemite, it was this uh, native history that was sort of um, edited out of the landscape, like I said, in the 1860s. This is made into a park in the 1960s. So maybe is it different? Well, it's not. Um, <laughs> Both it has a native history, which because I'm not an archaeologist, I don't actually have a lot of research in that area. As a historian, um, I'm more interested in the more recent history of this place. And since the 1860s, late 1850s, Point Reyes was a dairying landscape with uh, managed as, as a whole series of... Um, of dairy ranches. This land was originally um, a Mexican or actually, yeah, Mexican land grant in the 1930s. Um, as often happened here in California after we became part of the US and became a state, there were a lot of legal disagreements over who owned which pieces of land. And um, so those would go to court. And in many instances, including here, instead of either of the two parties fighting over the land, because the legal fees were so high, the land ended up in the hand of the lawyers, which was what happened here. Um, two brothers, I kid you not, their last name is Shafter. It just seems sort of appropriate. Um, and then there, one of them had a, a son-in-law. So you have James Shafter owned part of the land. Uh, Charles Howard was his... Um, son-in-law, and uh, I forget what the O stands for, Oliver maybe, uh, Oliver Shafter. The two, three of them co-owned this entire peninsula and created a system of tenant-run ranches. So they owned the land. They set up all of these ranches. They were lawyers, so they came up with very creative names, A Ranch, B Ranch, C Ranch, D Ranch, all the way up to the point a friend of theirs, Solomon Pierce, owned Tamales Point, so it's called the Pierce Ranch. It's not part of the alphabet system. The alphabet comes back down the peninsula, and eventually they run out of letters. So then the southern end of the park, you have ranch names that are more natural names, like South End and Wildcat Ranch and Lake Ranch and so on. Um, from 1858 until sort of roughly the 1920s and 30s, this system, each ranch was run by a tenant family. Um, there were three different sort of waves of um, immigrants that came to this area and that had experience running dairies. And so they were often chosen as the people to, um, to run these ranches. There's a group from um, the Azores that live mostly out here and still do. There's a group from Ireland, also a big dairying landscape, that are up on Tamales Point in the north. And then inland you have more Italian-speaking, uh, pardon me, Swiss speaking, uh, Italian-speaking Swiss. Um, so you get names like Giacomini and Gambonini and Dulcini and all these eeny names. Um, what's interesting about this, the Shafters own this landscape, like I said, from 1858 until the 1920s or so, when the heirs to the original owners started to sell off chunks. In an unusual twist, instead of selling off to sort of outsiders, they sold off for the most part to the tenant families. This is really one of those sort of classic and almost 
made up and you know, it just seems like these never really happen sort of american dream stories right you emigrate to the u.s you work hard as a tenant and eventually you become the landowner um very much that story so um many of the uh families that owned these ranches when the park was created have been there and some of them that are still there have been there for five or six generations which for california is pretty darn old you know for back east or in europe 150 years is nothing, but out here, that's pretty unusual. Um, around the same time as this conversion from the shafters owning, the shafter family owning the land to the, the tenant families owning it, most of the dairies converted from produ producing butter and cheese, which was mostly shipped by schooner, to, shipping, to creating um, liquid milk and shipping it by, by truck. Um, roads got improved around the same time, refrigeration got improved, and now selling liquid milk is much more possible. Dairies are um, they're pretty extensive places. This is the Sea Ranch out on the peninsula, and um, this is another one further up on Tamales Point. They have a lot of buildings. There's certainly a lot of impacts. This is not a wilderness is the point I'm trying to make here. There's a lot of buildings, a lot of fences, a lot of land use going on here. Um, with a dairy, cows need to be milked twice a day, every day, day in, day out. They don't take vacations. They don't have weekends. So the cows are coming back to the barns twice a day. There's a lot of heavy impact around these barns in terms of environmental impact. Um, so not a pristine space, not a wilderness. Um, yet this was seen as a great place to put a national seashore. In the 1960s, um, this was a period of time there was a big sort of parks for the people movement across the nation. The National Park Service was specifically looking for places to create new parks that were close to urban areas and that would provide specifically beach access. Um, so this is really what the focus was. Both back east, you get places like Cape Cod, Cape Hatteras, all these national seashores, a whole bunch of national lake shores in the Great Lakes, and then a series of national seashores out here, including Point Reyes. Um, the way the park was set up initially was expressly designed to try and accommodate the still operating ranches. At that time, there were 25 uh, either dairy or beef ranches operating on the peninsula within the boundaries of the seashore. Um, trying to keep them in place was both a political necessity. The locals never would have gone along with this park idea if it was going to um, change their local economy as much as taking out 25 ranches. It would have had a huge impact. Um, but then also there's some, if you read through the hearings and the, the, other la the other sort of discussion that's going on about the park, there's a real appreciation of the scenic quality of of the pastoral landscape, saying, you know, for someone driving out from San Francisco, seeing cows and um, these beautiful pastures is actually part of the aesthetic experience. Um, so that was really sort of being touted as one of the um, one of the, the the strong points of this place. Um, but as you may hopefully are starting to get from this lecture today, the Park Service is, when it comes to preservation, it's not a neutral actor. It has built into that agency from its early history a really strong sense of what a national park is supposed to be like. And those early national parks are what's shaping that. So places like Yosemite are really kind of the model of how parks are going to be set up and managed. And places that have working landscapes like Point Reyes don't fit in as well. Um, I'm not sure if you can quite read it. I put a quote from a Park Service historian on this slide. Um, he says that given the strength and persistence of ancestral attitudes, these old ideas about what a park is supposed to be within the service, its core values are likely to unlast any one director, even one who is stubbornly determined to change them. These ideas are really built into the landscape itself and into the ways that we manage these spaces um, to try and, and sort of keep them as these unchanging natural scenery, um, places that have working lands, that have people living on them and livestock moving around in them don't fit that very well. And one of the things that's important to understand about the Park Service is, again, when it's first set, being set up, it's not a focus on natural resources. Ecology as a science doesn't exist yet in 1916, or it's barely starting to exist. Um, it's really a focus on the scenery, not on the science. Um, and that's followed through, actually, um, until fairly recently in the Park Service. 
Um, so this can sort of help us to understand some of the um, sometimes contradictory differences between what the agency sort of says they're wanting to do and what the actual outcomes of their management on the landscape can be. And that's really what I've found in my research at Point Reyes. So just a, a quick overview of some of the things that have happened there. Um, through the sort of management policies and actions, the Park Service has been slowly editing out a lot of the human history of this place, either physically through removing buildings. Roughly half of the buildings and other structures that were in place in 1962 are gone now. Um, and again, it's you know, not necessarily that they were the best things on earth, but they've either been removed or torn down or sometimes burned for fire training. This idea that we should push the landscape to being more natural looking and to have fewer structures in it. It's not a formal policy of the Park Service, but it's the way that their management actions tend to drive, almost without noticing it. When I actually did the count, you know, tried to figure out, well, how many from maps and photographs, how many buildings were there in 1962 and how many are there today? I think the Park Service was genuinely surprised that as many have disappeared as have. Um, so that, you know, it's not that they're conscious of these changes that they're causing over time, um, but that these things are happening sort of slowly through these ideas about what management should be driving for. Um, there's far fewer ranches in place in operation now. Um, where we went from 25 in 1962, there's currently 11, six that are dairies and five that are beef ranches within um, the the. Point Reyes boundary itself. Some of those ranches are being taken care of. Um, some of the still operating ones, are, they're, all, they're all still um, being lived in. Some of the ones that aren't being lived in are being taken care of, like, pardon me, I'm a little off, uh, the Pierce Ranch, which has become a sort of a walkthrough exhibit. The buildings, they've spent hundreds of thousands of dollars on fixing the buildings up with very um, historic preservation appropriate methodology. They use the right kinds of nails for the era that this was built and the right uh, technology for fixing them. Uh, it's, it's actually the ranch that's in the best shape in the park physically. Um, but you may be able to see there's little plaques and a path. Visitors can walk around and look at the buildings and sort of peer at them and read about them, but nobody lives there except for the main house, which is housing um, Park Service staff. Uh, other ranches that have uh, where the residents have either moved out on their own or actually have been evicted are not necessarily taken care of very well. This is the D Ranch out near Drake's Beach. Um, this is the main old Victorian house dating back to the 1880s. And a photograph of the same spot from the 1950s. Um, when it, I, You can't really see it very well in the, from this distance, but there's beautiful roses on each side, and everything's in perfect shape. Uh, many of the neighbors described to me that back in its day, the D Ranch was the prettiest ranch on the point. You know, it really was just kind of a showcase. And you can see that now it's been sitting empty for about 10 years. Um, a bunch of the windows are broken. The fog, this is an area that's incredibly foggy, incredibly windy, um, a lot of salt air from the ocean. An unlived-in building is going to deteriorate very quickly. And in fact, the old creamery, which also dated from the 1880s, which was just across the way from this building, collapsed a few years ago um, and has now been sort of taken away. With the area, there's also been creation of wilderness, designated wilderness, uh, making this lived in place into sort of this wild, pristine nature. And that's come complete with wildlife. These are tule elk that had lived on the Point Nares Peninsula back in the 1800s and long before. They had been hunted out of, um, out, out of the area by about the 1850s, even before the dairy started moving in, um, and were gone from this region until they were reintroduced in 1978. Um, they've since proliferated. Their, their, um, their herds are doing quite well. There's a, real, there's a lack of large predators in what would have been a natural I'm putting natural in air quotes, um, a natural Miwok-managed landscape, you would have had uh, coastal Miwok peoples burning the landscape with some regularity, and you would have had grizzly bears and mountain lions picking off some of the, mostly the young tule elk, um, would have kept the population in check. They're also, they would have been hunted by the Miwok. Right now, there's no hunting, and there's no large predators, except for a couple of mountain lions living sort of up on the Inverness Ridge. Um, so there's nothing to control this population, and it's booming. 
Um, it's taken a few dips in recent years because of drought. But there's really been this big management question of what do we do to manage these these animals? Um, they've talked about using contraception, which I don't even want to know the details of, um, or possibly moving some of them out to another park. It's this place that's sort of almost masquerading as being wild and natural, yet it's deeply managed. It's, you know, they, they, they can't just leave the elk alone and, and sort of leave everything untouched. There's a need to keep, in, uh, keep trying to shape this place to make it look like sort of the iconic nature that we all expect when we arrive um, in, in a park. Um, what little historical material there is at, at Point Reyes. The next time you're out there, you know, check out the visitor center. Check out the one at Drake's Beach. They, um, there's really very little historical material um, in sort of interpreted for visitors. What there is is mostly focused on Sir Francis Drake, who um, probably landed for about a week when his ship was blown off course in, what, the 1400s sometime. Um, the more recent past in terms of the ranches and the very long past of the coastal Miwok, neither one is very well represented in the sort of park's interpretation of the history of this place. Um, what's been really striking, and again, I'll sort of wrap up with this, um, is that not only most visitors, it's understandable that most visitors don't know the history of this place because it's not being interpreted by the park service for them, but even the park managers don't um, don't remember or don't have any ideas of what this old history was, of what was there before they showed up. Um, park managers, park um, staff, like any other job, has turnover, right? So um, someone might work there for five years and then move on to another park. Um, the people who come in don't have a lot of material to read on the history of this place, so gradually the memory of what was there fades away. Um, they don't interact very much. The staff don't interact very much with the ranchers who still live within the seashore. And ever since I started, I've been researching this place since the late 1990s, when people visit the seashore for the first time, there's often a lot of questions about why are there cows here? What are the, why are there ran ranches? don't seem like they belong in a national park. Because, again, we bring our own ideas of what a national park is supposed to be, and we don't remember seeing cows in Yosemite or in Yellowstone, or any of the other sort of big national iconic parks. Um, so then it, again, becomes this self-replicating cycle where people question the, the original residents of this park and why they're still in place. They don't know the story of how they got there, um, and so then sort of advocate for them to be moved out. And there's been a number of lawsuits in recent years trying to more actively push some of the, the last remaining residents out of the park. Um, so one of the things I want you to, you know, just closing here with this image of the, of the pastoral landscape at Point Reyes, um, is remembering that all landscapes have histories. And even places that we think of as natural landscapes have histories that often is quite invisible to us as a, as a viewer. Um, these places were shaped by other people's lives, whether that be Native Americans or more recent um, settlers like the ranchers at Point Reyes. And I think there's a need to have, if not a formal recognition of their relationship with the landscape, at least a respect for the, the ways in which their work has literally made these places. Um, the reason that there are grassy fields out at Point Reyes, um, which are very green this time of year and very lush, is because of the Miwok burning for hundreds or thousands of years, and then because cattle ranching has been taking place since then. If you take the cattle off, if you take the burning off, just like at Yosemite Valley with the conifers moving in, here you have coastal brush moving in, taking over. You wouldn't have green grass anymore um, because these coastal grasslands are not in themselves natural landscapes. They're created landscapes through people's work. Um, so trying to understand both the fact that people were in these places or if they still are, valuing their, their, their uh, contribution to that place. So that's sort of the end of my lecture today. I wondered if you guys had any questions that I can answer. Can you ask that question again? What, what got <laughs> you interested in Point Reyes in the first place? Ah, what, the question is what, what got me interested in Point Reyes in the first place. Um, 
in, I, I got very interested. I, I come from a background as a as a biologist, as an undergraduate. Uh, that was my, um, my I got my my um, college degree in biology from UC Berkeley, and I thought I was good. My parents are both biologists. Um, I thought I was going to be a biologist, but I started getting really interested in the sort of social and cultural aspect of how we think of the natural world. I realized I wasn't so interested in taking the frog apart, but thinking about how we. Um, think about frogs or why we think they're important or et cetera. And so I, I started getting more into sort of the social science aspects of, of natural landscapes. And then specifically, I took a class at UC Berkeley in my, in my graduate program from a law professor named Joe Sachs, who was teaching a class on preservation law. Um, and he, what was unusual was he spent half the semester talking about natural preservation, about national parks, about endangered species, um, about wilderness. And then the rest of the, the other half of the semester, we talked about cultural preservation. So we talked about museums and communities try, like the Amish who are trying to protect their sense of cultural identity um, and working landscapes like Point Reyes. And I started to realize how similar the impulses of preservation are on the sort of natural and cultural side. And so I got really interested in places where they come together. And to me, that's what national parks are, is that they're these odd natural and cultural constructs, but we tend to pretend the cultural isn't there. Um, and we only see the natural. And so Point Reyes, because it is a lived-in national park, that's fairly unusual in the United States today. There are some. There's probably 50 or 60 that have some kind of land use and or residents living in the park. Um, but out of 400-some-odd national park units, that's not very many. Um, so it was conveniently located nearby. Um, and as I moved from being a graduate student at Berkeley and getting a job here at Sonoma State, it was still conveniently nearby. Um, but it also had that mixture of natural and cultural um, that I found just very intriguing to try and understand how did we move from a fairly um, corporatized, in a way, landscape, you know, one that was divided out into ranches and being utilized for economic use to something that is sort of recreated as pristine nature and understanding that transformation. So it's a perfect case study for seeing that change over time. Other questions about preservation or parks? I have a question. Um, in the chapter we read for today, you talk about how um, those in power in society influence what's valued and what's preserved. Um, I'm wondering what you think about the current presidential administration, the impact it might have on a place like Point Reyes and other national parks. That is a excellent question that I have absolutely no idea <laughs> how to answer. I've actually been asked this question a few times since the election in November. Um, it's hard to say. The Some people would presume that the new administration is more open to um, either privatizing public lands. The guy that he that he's appointed, um, Zinke, I think is his name, as the Secretary of the Interior, has been pretty explicitly not an advocate for privatization of public lands. Um, so that seems like it's probably not on the table. There might be more openness to this kind of working landscape, to the the recognizing that you can have economic uses of land and environmental protection at the same time, that they don't have to be oppositional. Um, that said, the new administration doesn't seem particularly supportive of environmental concerns at all. Um, so that's where it's kind of a wild card, I think, at this point in terms of how that will affect management on the ground. The other interesting factor, this is unique to the Park Service and more current day Park Service rather than the history of the Park Service, um, is that each individual park, they're each created by a separate act of Congress. They're not sort of, there's no blanket authority over all of them. There's, a, there's some guidelines that the Park Service has as its national policy, but each individual superintendent of each park, each you know, Yosemite, uh, Yellowstone, Point Reyes, each superintendent has a lot of authority, a lot of latitude to make their own decisions about how to manage that place. And so there's a real um, 
very wide discretion that they have, and so a real variation in terms of how parks are managed. Um, I've often used a comparison of Point Reyes to um, another park that's in Ohio called Cuyahoga Valley National Park, I think it is. Um, it used to be National Recreation Area, where this is a place where the, the current superintendent has been very interested for the last 15, 20 years in actually bringing agriculture back into the park after it had been pushed out through a bunch of evictions in the 1970s, um, and has come up with some really um, interesting models for possibly doing that, of, of creating sort of new long-term leases for agriculturalists who are, uh, will commit to being organic, to um, having a fairly small-scale production for not minding um, tourists coming by and looking at what they're doing. Uh, there's a whole bunch of rules, but there's sort of this new model for, for encouraging agriculture. Um, you would think it's a national agency. It's, if that was happening in one place, it would be happening in the other. In, at least until fairly recently, the opposite has been happening at Point Reyes, where the, there's been a de-emphasis of the agricultural landscape and more of the natural, natural scenery. Um, so there's this sort of um, lack of consistency across parks, which means that a new administration at the national level doesn't actually necessarily change very much at the each park level, because those superintendents have a lot of, of discretion to kind of do their own thing and maybe go a different direction than the national level is going. So that's a long way of saying, I don't know. <laughs> but time will tell. Anything else? All right, then we'll wrap up the lecture for the day. Let's take a break, and we will do our discussion of the readings afterwards. Thanks so much. Thanks for listening to C-SPAN's Lectures in History podcast. If you're interested in hearing more history, check out Season 2 of the Presidential Recordings podcast. The second season focuses on taped conversations between President Richard Nixon on topics ranging from the Watergate scandal to his nominees for the Supreme Court. The Presidential Recordings podcast is available wherever you get your podcasts. <laughs>